Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Well, it's a very exciting day here in the Blondie Hacks shop. It's new machine day, best day ever. What did I get? No spoilers. Let's go. This new machine is quite heavy, so I'm going to need my Harbor Freight hydraulic lift cart to get it out of the car. And you should check out the video series where I made these collapsing hinges for this cart. Made it super extra useful. And no, it's not a gas generator. That's just the box that the generous donor shipped it in. Uh, this thing is heavy. It's about 100 pounds, and the weight is all kind of on one side, which made it very awkward to get it out of the car. Nope. It, nope. It just... What about... No. Maybe... Uh, no. Nah, mm, what if I... Mm. Huzzah. Ooh, this is very exciting. I've been waiting for this thing for quite a while, and I'm super, super stoked to get a look at it. Yeah, it looks to be very well packaged. Let's see if it survived the journey. And to get this thing out of the box, we'll use a trick that I picked up on one of my first jobs that involved carting around very heavy computer monitors. They were about 80 pounds, and uh, the way you got them out of the box was by cutting the box off the monitor, rather than trying to lift the monitor out of the box. Oh, here we go. What is it? It is a D-bit grinder. These are also called single lip cutter grinders, and uh, they're kind of a primitive form of tool and cutter grinder, and they're primarily designed for making like engraving bits or D bits, hence the name, but uh, you can also use them to sharpen drill mitts, to regrind end mills, uh, to make lathe tools, uh, all kinds of really cool stuff. Now I have not tried to power this thing up and I'm not going to until I've gone through it thoroughly. Who knows if the bearings are seized or what kind of electrical condition it's in. I'm just not going to take any chances. It's not going to have any power applied until I've completely gone through it. The YouTube guru of these machines is Stefan Gotzventers, and I'll link to his channel here. He's got a bunch of great videos on these machines, and uh, you know I've been binge watching his videos, and uh, he really shows how versatile these machines really are. You know he uses them to neck down end mills, and he makes dovetail cutters and T slot cutters, and uh, all kinds of really cool stuff. And the donor included this box of miscellaneous parts that uh, seemed to be near it, uh, wherever it was living for the past 30 years or so. So let's see here, we've got uh, collet and, and and a collet and, and another collet. And yep, it's a collet and a collet. And these collets are really cool. They have a buttress thread on them, which is a thread form you don't see very often. It's a very, very strong type of thread. And I actually learned from Stefan's videos that this is sometimes called a, a decal collet because it was the collet used by the original decal FP1 milling machine. And uh, they used to be very difficult to get apparently, but you can now get Chinese clones of them. And uh, I've got a set here of unknown origin, but uh, looks like I have what I need. And the donor also included a couple of baggies of miscellaneous, and I have no idea what all these little parts are. Some might be for this grinder, some might not be, but uh, you know, I'll keep it all together until I know for sure. My plan for this grinder is to tear it completely down. Uh, I don't know how much of a restoration I'm going to do on it, but I'm at least going to tear it all down, clean it up, check the bearings, uh, check the, the wiring, all that sort of thing. And a bag of ball bearings for some reason? I don't know. We'll get there. Now temporarily this thing is living here on top of this cabinet because I don't have anywhere else to put it. I would never operate it in this position because these things shower grit and it's way too close to the lathe, but that means I need a way to transfer it to my workbench to work on it. And this thing is extremely heavy, much too heavy for me to lift and carry across the shop, so I devised this uh, system here involving uh, a board and uh, a bucket on top of my Harbor Freight lift cart. I, uh, I've said before how useful this hydraulic lift cart is, but uh, you know, it sit times like this, it's just, uh, gosh, this thing is useful. So while I'm cleaning this guy up, I can talk a little bit about it. Uh, this is a Coolman SU2 cutter grinder, and uh, it looks like it dates from maybe the 1980s, something like that. Uh, the Coolman company does still exist, and I contacted them uh, to see if they had any, any information on it. I sent them uh, the serial number and the model number and some pictures, and uh, they were very friendly, but uh, kindly instructed uh, that uh, that machine is no longer supported and that I should buy a new one and offered to sell me the current version of this, which is called the SU Diamante. 
however, this machine was uh, imported by Coolman, Illinois, uh, which I guess is who was doing it in the United States at the time. And uh, it says it was made in West Germany, so I guess that dates it to uh, before the Berlin Wall fell, at least. So it's uh, it's pretty old, but it's not like a super super old machine. Now these machines are all basically clones of the Deckel SO cutter grinder, which is very handy because uh, parts uh, are obtainable for that and uh, you can also get pretty good documentation. I wasn't able to find any Kuhlman cutter grinder documentation from this era, but I was able to find a uh, great owner's manual and uh, parts diagrams for the Deckel SO from roughly this period. Okay, with it all clean, let's see if I can take the wheel off. This is an aluminum oxide wheel that was on there. It's uh, in pretty sad shape, but uh, there doesn't appear to be any kind of a spindle lock or anything, so I can't, uh, I can't get any of the fasteners on the front of this wheel to break loose. However, there is what appears to be a pair of spanner holes here, and uh, I don't have a spanner wrench that will fit that. However, I do have this eighth inch drill rod that's almost a perfect fit. It's just a hair too big, so I think I can make a spanner wrench out of that. So I've got some square stock here to make the handle with, and it's brass, which is a little silly for her making a spanner wrench out of, but it's what I have that's the right size. So cut it to length with the porta band and uh, cleaning up that end now with some files. I start with the coarse file, and then I clean it up with a fine mill file. So now I'm gonna make those pins, and uh, I'm gonna cover the ways because we're gonna be doing some uh, abrasive work here, and I only need to take a few thou off of this drill rod, so I'm gonna start by uh, filing it down. And then we'll clean up those file marks with some 320 grit emery paper. And then I thought I'd get cute and see if I can just uh, part those pins off and save myself some steps. So I got the parting blade in there and we'll square it up. And then we'll move the parting blade in as close to the chuck as I can get it and then mark off the 750 thou that we need for each pin. And then start making my cut. Now, this is really not cutting very well. This uh, tiny, tiny drill rod is just too flexible with no tail support. Uh, I don't like the way that's cutting, so uh, I took the uh, tool out and I put a fresh hone on it and uh, checked the center height and gave it another shot. And now it's cutting better, but uh, it's still bending the rod and the rod really wants to climb up on that parting blade and I'm really not comfortable with it. So I took it to the bandsaw and uh, cut the pieces and now I'm just facing off the ends. Sometimes discretion is the better part of valor. And I'm deburring those ends just to make them nice. And repeat with the other end and repeat for both pins. Now for the handle, I'm just going to uh, get the width of it and then take half of that on my calipers and then blue up the area with some uh, Sharpie marker and then scribe my center line. And then I can scribe the distance from the end for the first pin. And then for the second pin, I need to know the distance between the pins quite precisely. So I can just install those pins I made and measure off of them to get the distance that I need. And then I'll center punch those and set them up in the mill for drilling. Tappy tap tap. So I'm gonna drill these 1 64th under 1 8th because I'm gonna be reaming these to final dimension. I'm going uh, for a, a light press fit on these pins. Here's a quick and dirty way to line up a drill on a punch mark. Just turn the chuck by hand and you can see if the little divot that it makes is centered on your mark. And next I'm gonna come in with an eighth inch undersized reamer. So that's 124 thou, which in principle should be a one thou press fit on my eighth inch drill rod. However, in practice, drill rod has some variance in it. You know, it's uh, unless you buy the really expensive stuff, it's got maybe a half thou of tolerance on the diameter. So. Uh, I drill it uh, undersize and then uh, I check the fit and it feels like it's too small. It doesn't feel like it's gonna wanna press in there. So I went back in with the full eighth inch reamer and uh, yeah, this turned out to be actually a little too large. Now it was kind of a slip fit, but that's okay. We can just bust out the Loctite 603 and it'll secure those pins in there just fine. And uh, it's really important to clean everything really thoroughly when using Loctite 603. 
Otherwise, it, uh, it won't cure properly inside the, uh, inside the hole there. Okay, our little spanner wrench is looking good. We'll clean up the excess Loctite there. The stuff that's exposed to the air won't ever cure properly, so you got to wipe it off. Okay, so let's give it a try here on the grinder. It fits in there really well. And uh, unfortunately, however, I still can't get that hub to loosen off of there. And uh, still need some kind of a spindle lock. So, however, I have an idea. If I make a hole right through the center of this tool, then I can get that Allen key in there and I can use the two tools against each other and one of these fasteners, either that one in the center or the hub holding the wheel will break free. So I center punch that and then back over to the mill, set it up on my thin parallels and uh, my pins are gonna be fine. They'll just go between those thin parallels and a little bit of WD-40 on there and I'm just gonna drill this through. Uh, I believe this is a 200 thou drill. And now I have a spanner wrench with a hole in it. All right, let's try this guy out and see how it works. So the wrench goes on there and the Allen key goes right through the middle. And now I can work these guys against each other and Yahtzee, that guy broke loose. And now I can take that fastener out. I don't know what's exactly gonna happen here. Okay, it looks like the whole arbor is gonna come off with the wheel, but that uh, that's just uh, fine long as something's coming apart. And here we get our first look at the spindle nose and uh, yeah, it's a dual grinding wheel so it was probably a nice wheel back in its day. And uh, the spindle nose actually looks to be in excellent excellent condition so that's really good news. So now we can start breaking into the actual casting here try to get these covers off. So nothing's just too seized up here which is good news. And looks like this whole piece is going to come off now. Yeah, look at that. Wow, look at that casting. No wonder this thing is the size of a bread box yet somehow manages to weigh 100 pounds. That is a serious piece of cast iron for what's basically a dust cover. And as you can imagine, there's just grinding dust in and on every single nook and cranny. So I'm doing my best to clean it all up as I go along. I don't think I'm going to repaint this guy. The paint's actually in really good shape. So now we get our first look at the drive belt, and uh, yeah, it looks like that guy's still got some life in it, so I'll reinstall that after this restoration is done. I guess it's safe to say that your drive belt is toast when you can remove it with a vacuum cleaner. So next we'll see if we can get this little arm off. This swinging arm holds the dressing diamond, and that comes right off, looking good. And oh, look at that. There's actually a thrust bearing in there. This thing just oozes quality everywhere I look. Uh, that's, wow. I don't think you would see a thrust bearing on a little swinging arm like this in uh, uh, a cheap uh, replica of a grinder like this today. But uh, it does actually make sense because that diamond dressing point is, uh, you know, under a quite a bit of uh, stress against up against the wheel. So a thrust bearing on this arm does make sense to get a proper uh, dressing action. And if I could loosen this uh, locking screw here, I don't know if this mechanism still works, and yeah, actually it does. So this thumb screw allows you to dial the dressing diamond in and out as you dress the wheel, so that's pretty cool. Now, I don't know if this diamond is actually any good. It's really hard to tell. The end of this thing's pretty beat up. So I gave it a, a touch up with some emery cloth, because of course you can't hurt it, it's a diamond. And uh, yeah, if you shine the light on it just right, you see how uh, the diamond is shining, it's reflecting the light, so it looks like that diamond probably does still have some life in it. That's going to do it for the first installment on my Coolman SU2 cutter grinder restoration. I'm probably going to need a lot of parts for this thing, so if you want to help out, go ahead and hit my Patreon. Thanks for watching.